when the hurt goes deeper than the deepest place your heart has ever known when you're standing in your darkest trial and it seems you're standing all alone when the tears fall down like bitter rain and you're wondering if the sun will shine again in the midst of disappointment look around you'll find a faithful friend he's walked through my darkest valley shining light upon the lily by the way he has picked me up and held me when i thought i could not face another I can tell you by experience, I found a faithful friend. Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother ever can. When the ones that you have trusted prove untrue, on him you can depend he will never fail or let you down and his love will help your broken heart mend so pick up the broken pieces and turn around you'll find a faithful friend could not face another day and when my heart has stopped its singing and my mind is simply searching for an end I can tell you by experience I found a faithful friend I can tell you by experience, I found a faithful friend. I love that song. I've always loved that song. I am learning that the older that I get now, don't look at me funny, because I know, I'm reminded every time that I come here that there's people here that changed my diapers in the nursery and that have seen me. I get it. I know. I'm still a pretty young buck. But I will say this. The most important line in that song is that line where it says, I can tell you by experience that I have found a faithful friend. I have had the privilege and the opportunity my entire life of being in church. I mean, from before I was born up to all the way up through majority of my formative years, I was a pastor's son, and the Lord has given me the opportunity to serve Him in full-time ministry. But there's nothing that you appreciate more than the experience of living life with Jesus. And we talked this morning, and we're going to look at a little bit more, but we talked about that spiritual warfare and I think sometimes we ask ourselves, why does God allow us to go through the fight? I mean, why, why doesn't God just make everything good? Why, why doesn't he just, I mean, why doesn't he just go ahead and squash Satan, just nip it in the bud, so to speak, and just, and just move on? And it's because that experience of going through some things, 
that experience of fighting the fight, that experience of having to rely on Jesus is how he manifests his faithfulness to us. And it deepens our love for him. It doesn't change his love for us one way or the other. He loves us the same. But what it does is it makes us more aware of his love and it draws us closer to him. So with that in mind, we talked this morning a little bit at one of the ways that Satan brings this warfare against us and he targets us with distraction and how we've got to be on guard against the distraction, how we've got to intentionally focus and understand and be aware that we are, in fact, in a spiritual war. But I think one of the other areas, one of the other prevalent areas, and there's a long list, but I think one of the, the other major areas that he targets us with is this thing of fear. Fear is such a powerful motivator and also inhibitor because fear will motivate you to do a whole long laundry list of stuff people have made some of the worst decisions in their entire life because they were afraid i know this is in the grand scheme of things it's it's not a a huge ordeal but i i remember back uh, i guess it was 2008 when that when that first stock market crash thing was going and people pulled out their entire life savings because It was plummeting, they got afraid, they feared, and so they pulled out. And they ended up losing, I mean, just everything that they had built their entire life for. That once they had the benefit of hindsight and they looked back, they said, man, I wish I never would have done that. I wish I would have just had a little bit of a level head. I wish I would have just waited. But because they became overwhelmed in fear, therefore they made a rash decision, and therefore they were left with crumbling results. Fear is a very, very, very strong thing. It is why we have the verse in the New Testament which says, But God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God does not operate and motivate by fear. See, I'm afraid that we have done that far too many times. And listen, I understand the reality of hell is a, is a very uh, fear-inducing Thing. But that is not the primary motivator that Jesus uses with us. He's not trying to get us into heaven because we're afraid of hell. He is trying to showcase us, look, this is your reality, but I loved you enough to keep you from there. That is the motivator of Jesus. He motivates through his love which he has displayed towards us. Yes, hell is a very real place. It is a very scary place, but God is not in heaven throwing down on us saying, you better be afraid, you better be... No, he's saying, listen, you don't have to be afraid because I love you so much. Boy, how many of us have ever been afraid since we've been saved? Now, if you don't have to raise your hand, that's okay. I'll just know that you're raising your hand like this because we're all afraid. We all struggle with this thing of fear. Uncertain days come up where there's questions that we don't have answers to. And there's all of this stuff that's happening. And we have to contend against fear because Satan is attacking us with fear. But I'm convinced of this as well. One of the primary fears which we deal with is this fear of being exposed for who we really are. It is an inerrant fear within all of us. This is going to be kind of a silly illustration, but don't throw rocks at me. Give me, a, give me time to explain it, and I think you'll agree with me. You realize the makeup industry has made a lot of money on people's fear of being exposed? Now, you think about it. Why is it so important? Because, well, I've got blemishes, or I'm trying to hide aging, or this, that, and the other. And so they are applying this over Fear of being exposed in their natural condition. Now I said, don't throw rocks at me because apparently that's becoming a big popular thing with men too. Men, if there's any men in here that you're wearing makeup, I ain't got no qualms against you. More power to you. Just don't tell me at the back door because I might make a face and I don't want to hurt nobody in here's feelings. <laughs> but I know that, but what, what is that? It's, it's because they're, they're trying to hide something up. Now again, I ain't got nothing against makeup. I understand the concept behind it but ultimately that that's what that is it is that root of i don't want something that i'm ashamed of or i'm embarrassed of or i look at and say oh i wish that wasn't there and so it's a cover-up and it's this thing that is that is a part of 
our DNA as mankind that dates all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Because that's the whole reason that Adam and Eve sowed dumb fig leaves. Now you think about this. I don't know if you've ever stopped and thought about this before, but you want to talk about one of the dumbest things to ever be done. Adam and Eve, who walked with God in the cool of the day, don't think that God's going to notice something different about y'all. You got all them leaves draped around you for. But it was from their fear of being exposed. They knew there was something now broken inside of them. They knew there was now a wrong standing between them and God, and therefore they did not want to be exposed, and so they tried to cover it up. What was that? It was fear. What did Adam tell God? I hid myself because I was afraid. Fear. Now that there is cause for the accuser to have some legitimate ammunition to throw our way, we have a fear. Because I don't care how good of a person is seated in here today, there is something about you that you're ashamed of. There is something in your past that you look at and you say, man, I, I wish that wasn't there. Man, if I could just go back and fix that, if I could just go back and do that differently, if I could just go back and never go down that path, and it brings shame. Do you know whose voice that is? Yeah, it ain't Jesus's. I referenced this verse this morning, and boy, I'm telling you, this, it, it, it's becoming a far more powerful verse in my life each and every day. There is therefore now no condemnation them which are in Christ Jesus. We preach that when Jesus died and shed His blood on Calvary, He died for every sin, past, present, and future. He died for the sins that I committed before I got saved, and He died for the sins that He knew I was going to commit after I got saved. When God looks at me, He does not see a sinner. He sees one of His sons. And I thank the Lord for that. But we don't see ourselves that way. We struggle with that. Now, we have the opportunity to see ourselves that way, and God wants us to see ourselves that way. But Satan doesn't want you to see yourself that way. Because a child of God that sees himself as redeemed in the sight of God is one that is motivated to live for God. Satan doesn't want that. He wants every time you look in the mirror for you to be ashamed, for you to be cast down, for you to be beat down because of whatever it is in your past. This thing manifests itself with insecurities. People afraid of being exposed and not being as strong of a leader in this aspect. Or, I don't have as much to contribute here, there, and yonder. And so what it does is it makes them incapable of doing anything because of an inherent fear. Something that is inside of them which is crippling them and it is keeping them afraid. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer Something along these lines. You go and you go to pray to the Lord and it's almost as if you're having to let Him know where you're weak. Almost like you're having to let Him know, Lord, I, I'm struggling with this. And, and it's almost as if you're informing God, can I go ahead and, and, and listen, you got to pray, you got to talk to the Lord through this, but can I go ahead just to the next few minutes and just go ahead and, and put you at ease a little bit and let you know that Jesus already knows. He already knows where you're broken. He already knows what He had to work with when He saved you. He already knows what He has to work with right now as He presently looks at you. He knows. And I don't care whether you're a spiritual giant or whether you're a babe in the faith. And I can prove it. Take your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 is where we're going to be at tonight. I love this passage of Scripture. I get, I get help, and, and I think you understand what I'm saying. I get help from being able to see where other people struggle. Not in like a, a, a sick kind of way, like, yeah, they're struggling too. That makes me feel better. But no, in a way that I can see that they're struggling, and yet Jesus is helping them in their struggle, I can learn and I can glean some lessons that will help me in my struggle. And the Apostle Paul right here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, is being transparent with an area of his struggle. Now, the first five verses of 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, Paul goes on and he talks about how 
he knew this man that was given uh, special access into heaven. He was translated up to heaven. He was able to see some things. And Paul said whether he saw it physically in the flesh, whether it was just a vision, I don't know. God knows. <clears throat> but Paul said, I, I knew him. Now, some speculate and believe that Paul is actually referring to himself. Some say that this was just an acquaintance, that Paul was able to, to, to hear this testimony and it was validated by God. Either way, Paul was privileged to some pretty sensitive information. He was able to see something that very, very, very few human beings who were alive on earth have ever been able to see and return back. And so Paul is saying, this is what I had yet, verse number 6. He says, for though I would desire to glory. Glory in what? I don't care how spiritual, humble, meek, and mild you are. There is a temptation when you are someone like Paul that has that kind of connection. There's a temptation to say, God thinks pretty highly of me. Wow, what a, what a blessing. What an opportunity to be able to be gifted this. And that pride, there's an opportunity for it to creep up. And Paul said, I would desire to glory. My flesh wants to write you and say, hey boys, y'all listen up. I'm somebody special. He said, but I shall not be a fool. That would be a foolish thing to do. I'm not going to do that. For I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. He said, I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to tell you this stuff. I'm not going to go into the full depths of everything because that's not really pertinent right now. And lest you think that I've got ulterior motives, none of that's important. He said, but I will say this. This is the lesson. Paul said, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Now, if you'll notice, <coughs> excuse me, verse number 7, we've used this verse a lot of times. And we use it in a capacity to kind of insinuate that, that God brought some kind of difficulty into the life of the Apostle Paul in order to keep him humble. And again, I believe there's an application to that that's made. But there's a key phrase that's right there in the middle. It says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. This was the thorn. It was the messenger of Satan to buffet me. It was the messenger of Satan. This was not something that God was bringing into Paul's life in order to keep him humble. It's actually more closely associated with the life of Job. Satan wants to bring his attack, and God in his permissive will says, I'll allow it. Not because he's angry, not because he's punishing Paul or he was punishing Job, but because he was working something and was going to work it through Satan's attack. And Paul said this thorn, was it his eyesight, was it a physical condition? We don't know. But the important thing is this, Paul was in the midst of spiritual warfare. Paul was in the midst of an attack. Paul was going through something. And it was something that he was, whether it was an insecurity, whether it was an awareness that this is making my ministry difficult, whatever it is, it moved Paul to say, Lord, would you please take this away? Lord, would you please remove this? Would you please get rid of that thorn? Would you please get rid of this messenger? Would you please remove this out of my life? Now, I love verse number 9. Because this is where we get into the message for tonight. He said, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he, talking about Jesus, said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. We learn a lot about how someone thinks both by what they say but as well as what they don't say. You can learn a lot and the first thing that we learn is that Jesus already knows our weakness. 
Because when Paul comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I've got this thorn, I've got this thing that I'm struggling with, would you take this away? Jesus doesn't even acknowledge the thorn. He doesn't even say, Paul, I know you did this, that, and the other. Paul, I, I, I hear this. No, he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. Paul, I already know. And I'm prepared to handle it. Paul, I, I know this is a struggle for you. Paul, I know this is something that is a burden to you. My grace is sufficient. This isn't too big for me, Paul. I already know. Now you fill in the blank with whatever it is. Whether it's a personal insecurity about your ability to contribute to anything. Whether it's, whether it's a, a, something that you are ashamed of from your past. A failure, something like that. <clears throat> whether it's a, a direct assault. You fill in the blank with anything. Take it to Jesus and His response is going to be the same. I know. I know. I'm already aware of that. And you know what? I knew before you knew. I knew on Calvary. Nothing takes Him by surprise. And the way that that is, that that is relieving, the way that that enables me to get some help is to know that I have found a faithful friend. You think about this. You think about your closest, best buddy in the whole wide world. You say, oh man, there is nothing that would separate our friendship. And that's true to a degree. You and I well know that there are certain skeletons that if we found out was in their closet, it would impact that friendship. It might cause us to be a little hesitant to see them as much. Listen, you find out that your best friend is a serial killer that cooks people and eats them for supper, you're going to be a little hesitant to go to their house. Or am I just the only one that's got any kind of logic and common sense about it? That's how it's going to happen. Because we are imperfect people. And we do not have the divine touch and the divine enabling to fix what is broken in people. <laughs> but Jesus does. Every skeleton in your closet, everything that causes you to look at the mirror and to be upset and disappointed and disgusted about yourself, Jesus looks at it and He says, I already know! I've already seen it! You're not telling me anything I don't know. Listen to this and see if it sounds familiar. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. You know what that is? That is one of the lesser sung verses. The very popular song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Listen to verse 1. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. The truth of this song opens up when we have a better understanding of the type of prayer that it's talking about. It's not talking about the kind of prayer that is a laundry list of prayer list of this, that, and the other, and Lord, would you help me with this? Lord, would you help me with that? Lord, would you do systematic approach? That's not the kind of prayer that it's talking about. It's talking about the type of prayer where you go to Jesus and you say, Lord, I am broken about this. I am ashamed. I am embarrassed about this. This makes me sick to my stomach. I just can't even stand myself because of this. Jesus, how could you accept me with this? That is what opens us up to that still, small voice. Jesus saying, My grace is sufficient for thee. I already know. I've already seen it. I've got what you need 
to make it through. You know, he can't always take away the thorn. If you've got some fear because of something that you are ashamed of in your past, Jesus isn't going to come and pluck down that memory from your mind. He's not going to give you a magical time capsule to let you go back in time and just never do it. That's not how it works. But I tell you what he can do. Is he can reach down and he can remove that shame. Because I'll tell you this, if there is a holy God in heaven who is pure, perfect, and undefiled, who has never done any wrong, who has never conceived any wrong, if that God is able to look down and say, I see in you no condemnation, then why in the world should I beat myself up? If I have genuinely come to Him in repentance, and I have genuinely laid that before Him, and He has taken that away, and God doesn't see it anymore, why am I wasting so much time focusing on it? If I look at myself and I say, well, I'm not as good of an orator, or I'm not as good of a singer, or I'm just not as good at whatever, this, that, and the other. God's the one that created me. He's the one that made me like I am. Who am I to look at Him and say, God, you blew it with me. God, I just... Jesus says, no! My grace is sufficient for thee. Then we come to the second part of Jesus' answer. He says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know the problem when we listen to that voice of fear? We are putting our focus on the wrong person. When we are afraid, we are focused on us. Think about it. My wife is a stormophobe. Major stormophobe. Now the Lord's helping her with it. On no behalf of me, because I am a non-sympathetic stormophobe. I'm like, hey, listen. I mean, if I hear a train whistle and the tornado comes, we'll get in the house. By then it's too late. We're all dead. I can say that because our youngest had to get taken out to the nursery, so she's not here to evil eye me. So I'm sure she's probably listening somewhere, and I'll hear it later, but y'all pray for me. But when that fear begins to kick in, and now listen, I will go ahead and say this, a fear of weather and elements is a good fear, but it paints the good picture. I'm not afraid of a storm because I'm afraid of what it's going to do to my vehicle. There's no fear in a storm because of what it's going to do to the grocery store. Am I going to be able to get groceries tomorrow? The fear of the storm is just like the disciples when they were on that ship and that storm came up. They said, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? The fear in the storm is I'm afraid about me. <clears throat> what if that wind comes, blows this tree down, collapses through the roof? <clears throat> it's a fear of me. And that is what all fear is centered around. It is centered around me that fear of being exposed i don't want to be exposed that fear of insufficiency i am not enough you see the you see the theme that's why jesus's response to paul was he said paul my grace <clears throat> is sufficient for thee my strength is made perfect in weakness You'll notice that Jesus does not promise to make Paul stronger. He doesn't promise to impart Paul the strength in Paul's own self. He says, Paul, you let me handle this. You let me give to you what you need to conquer this. Because my strength is made perfect or complete or whole, or finished. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. I have, I have this thought with that, and I, I hope you'll give me a, a, a chance to explain it. We know that Jesus came to this earth, born as a baby, lived a sinless life, and died sacrificially for all of us. He was able to do that because of His great power no other man woman boy or girl has ever nor will ever be able to accomplish what jesus accomplished because of his strength but now think of it this way that is already 
a great display of power. But how much greater of a display of power is it for him to take a broken, wretched, sin-filled person and give them the victory to be able to live a life for him in spite of all that they are living around. See, now all of a sudden, it's one thing for me to be strong enough to take care of me. It's another thing for me to be strong enough to take care of you and to take care of you and to take care of you and to take care of you. See, now all of a sudden, wow, that's a lot of strength. And that's the lesson that Jesus is teaching. I want you to come to me broken. I want you to come to me weak and unable. Come unto me, he said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, all ye that are too weak to be able to deal with the burdens that you have. Come unto me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. I will equip you to be able to bear what you are tasked to bear. That's what Jesus is teaching Paul. He says, Paul, I already know about your thorn. I already know where you're weak. I already know where you're broken. And I have what you need to be successful. The accuser of the brethren has no desire in you learning that. He wants every time you look in the mirror for you to hate yourself. He wants every time that you think about your past for you to beat yourself up and say, man, I'm so ashamed about that. Because if you live there, you're focused on you. You're not focused on God. But the more that you walk in that, you know what, I am broken. I am insufficient. I am not enough. I am filled with shame of my past. That's not what God sees. God sees someone that was crafted and made in His image, that continues to bear His image, that has the blood of Jesus applied to Him, that now has the very nature of Jesus living and indwelling inside of Him, that now is one with God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, First John says. That is what God sees. And so the person that begins to focus on that now goes throughout life saying, it's not me, but it is all God. I'm nothing, and that's okay. Because God is everything. And He is the one that is giving me victory. See, now my focus is different. Now all of a sudden Satan's losing the spiritual war because he's not able to distract me. He's not able to discourage me. He's not able to get me focused on fear. Now my focus is on God and I am living the victorious Christian life and that is what God desires for us. I have come, Jesus said, that they might have life. They might have it more abundantly more vibrantly, more fruitfully, more in such a way that the world says, I don't understand how they're able to live like that. It's because they don't have Jesus and they don't have His grace. We do. We do not have to be afraid. We do not have to live in fear. We do not have to live in embarrassment and ashamedness regardless of what you tell yourself, regardless of what anyone else tells you about yourself. None of those other voices matter. The only voice that matters is the voice of Jesus that says, My grace is sufficient for thee, that my strength is made perfect in weakness. Come to me weak. Come to me broken. Let me give you what you need. Would you stand with us tonight?